Welcome back to Seaside 2020 Owners. I hope you all got some rest over the spring break as we're now in some trying times. You can see the upcoming events for the course that are over here post spring break. Uh, today we'll be finishing up our discussion of assembly control that will comprise this video along with a few course logistics that we'll deal with up front. Uh, we also have uh, some wrap up to do on assembly on the 20th. Next week, on Monday, we'll spend some time reviewing. Uh, I'll have a review exam for you. Uh, Tuesday, the third assignment programming project, uh, Project 3, is due. And on Wednesday, the 25th, a week from today, we'll have exam two. Logistics for that will come uh, shortly, uh, but for the moment, uh, bear with me. In case you didn't know, and I'll switch over to a web browser quick, uh, our course schedule has been updated, at least in the near term, uh, to reflect some of that stuff. I'll have slides for you down here associated with uh, data security, floating point operations, the wrap-up stuff associated with assembly uh, by Friday. And the slide deck that we'll be looking at presently is associated with what we're going to finish up uh, pre-spring break. So the slides there associated with assembly control. I want to take just a moment to look at the Canvas site as well uh, to apprise you what's going on there. Uh, if you buzz over to our Seaside 2021 uh, site, you'll see that a lot of the office hours now have been moved online. And in most cases, folks will meet at their standard times, but you'll want to click on a Zoom link over here in order to join up office hours. Mine, for instance, will still be Tuesday or Thursday, uh, approximately two, uh, 3 to 4 p.m., and you can find me uh, by clicking on a link over here. You'll see a proliferation of different uh, Piazza posts uh, that are announcing office hours are going to begin shortly. Uh, these will allow you to type in a follow-up to queue for those office hours. So if I were to pull up Piazza, for instance, uh, you'll see a lot of them probably let's see, not in 4061, but in 2021, uh, over here, uh, having to do with office hours. For instance, my virtual office hours down here, uh, which went on yesterday, uh, you can see folks queuing up uh, to get help, and I was able to work through and discuss course issues with all the folks uh, that were there. Uh, so please make uh, it a point to look at email, to sign on up on Piazza, to use the Zoom links that are provided. Make sure you have that software installed as it'll be a key element of interacting with course staff uh, going forwards. As for the moment, uh, we are going to pick up our discussion of assembly control and I'll hopefully have this video posted up to YouTube for you guys to consume prior to the lecture uh, time, at which point I'll also be on Zoom uh, in order to uh, guide a discussion and answer any questions about the lecture content. So let me switch over to the slide deck that we're at. Uh, just to briefly review, uh, we picked up discussion uh, sort of before spring break, uh, trying to resolve this central issue associated with procedures and returns from them. Uh, we had learned earlier on that this RIP instruction pointer is responsible for what instruction is going to be executed next in assembly. It's a special register that you don't interact with directly, but it's always there moving in the background. As an assembly construct, uh, instruction completes, it will automatically adjust in the processor to the next instruction to execute. And the jump instructions uh, call, make direct changes to the RIP uh, to assign a new value to it so you can move around an assembly in a nonlinear fashion. The call and return uh, instructions that are present in assembly have a similar effect in that they will change the RIP. But the important thing associated with uh, call procedure calls that distinguishes it from normal jumps is that calling is not a problem, as in there's some label uh, that's associated with the function that you can get to relatively easily, but return needs to know when you call a function how to get back to the function that called it. Example, I have a main function. Uh, it calls function A, uh, and when function A returns, control returns to, to the main function. However, if I'm running a function B and it calls function A, then in this case, when function A returns, it should go back to function B instead. Uh, to that end, this return and call uh, set of instructions needs to do a little bit of extra work in order to accomplish this locality, uh, to say I'm calling from a certain position and that's the position that I'll return to later on.
this is a spot then where the call instruction doesn't just change the rip, it also makes changes to the stack. And this is the first spot that we'll see instructions uh, adjusting RSP, the stack pointer. Uh, some changes will be moved there. In particular, the return address uh, that the RIP should be when a function finishes. In this case, whatever proc name is associated with. Uh, the return address uh, that I should come back to, uh, it's near to this instruction, will go into the stack. So we walk through this uh, set of pictures and examples to try and demonstrate this. At a high level, the call instruction does two things. Uh, it pushes a return address into the stack uh, and then changes the RIP to whatever the call function is. Uh, in this case, uh, the picture would be going from A to B. Uh, this is before uh, executing call and then after executing call. And the change that you should notice here is, number one, that the RIP changes. Was 563 is now 540. Uh, you note that uh, 563 is an address that is after 540. So clearly I'm moving in a nonlinear fashion here for the RIP. Uh, this 540 is probably the first instruction associated with some procedure. The other change that's happening is that the stack pointer is changing. You can see that in the picture here too, uh, that it was uh, pointing at 840 and it's now pointing at 838, uh, so it's somewhat lower uh, down there. Uh, this is the notion of growing the stack, and we've seen since early on that in the x86-64 architecture and a lot of other architectures, the stack starts at a high address and as it grows in size, uh, the top of the stack is at lower addresses. The other thing that you should notice then is that aside from growing, something interesting is then put in here, an address uh, ending in 568. You can see that's very close to the 563 here because this is 568 is likely the next instruction that's after this. Probably this uh, 563 is a call instruction uh, and the net effect of that here is going to be to grow the stack and change the rip. Uh, the return instruction then undoes those changes. Whatever the stack pointer is pointing at becomes the new RIP. So this 568 is picked up and copied into the RIP and the stack shrinks. Uh, this is a really common low level operation and that's why it's baked into an assembly instruction. Uh, you could affect it in the same way by, for instance, uh, manually putting things in the stack and then using a jump instruction. Uh, but this would take multiple cycles uh, and it's probably best to make use of the hardware uh, that's already present to make the calling sequence relatively fast. If you want some more excruciating detail uh, about how this looks, uh, then I turn your attention to the following example, which uh, uses the debugger to step through some code that is present in the code pack for today. Uh, just to briefly recount that, up here was a call site where a function named sunrange was being called. Uh, it's at address, uh, or first instruction for the uh, sum range, ends in 466A. As you can see, uh, we're up here at 468C, uh, so that's somewhat distant uh, from it. We're in a main function up here. If I, before executing this call instruction, ask the debugger, show me what some of these uh, values are, uh, then I'd see a report that the stack pointer uh, ends in uh, E460 and that the RIP is presently 468C, uh, that's right here. The call is going to set that to be uh, a new uh, instruction. Uh, and when I return from whatever uh, this function sum range is, the next instruction in main to execute is this uh, 4691. Uh, so my call, uh, sort of sequence of instructions to execute is uh, call, which jumps to this instruction, does a bunch of stuff there, and when that returns, come back to 4691. So this is essentially the next instruction in main. It's at address 4691, and that'll become important because as I would execute this call instruction uh, via this step command from, uh, step instruction from GDB, what you notice is that as expected, control-wise, I'm now in some range instead. Uh, that I jump to this instruction 466A, uh, and uh, that's where I'm uh, sort of gonna start executing things here in some range. Uh, the other major change then, uh, aside from the RIP being at a new position, is that the stack pointer has changed as well. It was 460 and now is 458. Uh, that's 8 bytes lower because we're in base 16 and that's the notion of the stack growing. If I use the following uh, GDB command to say show me the value that's stored at that address that the stack pointer's at, uh, 458, you'll see it's a familiar value 4691 because this is the return address. Um, eventually, I'm going to pick this value up off the stack and set the RIP to it, 
which will get me back up here into main uh, to continue on executing it. That's the effect that the return instruction has that we'll um, go through in just a second. So again, uh, to emphasize, the call instruction has two effects. It will change the RIP and also manipulate the stack to place a return address there uh, that will allow us to return uh, eventually to wherever we came from. Uh, to counterpoint that, uh, then the return instruction uh, makes use of the opposite set of interactions, that it will uh, pick up something off the stack, shrink the stack, and change the RIP to whatever that value is. You can see here the slightly obtuse invocation, uh, this ret q with the rep z in front of it that was a uh, discussion and a homework problem that it's a fix for some AMD processors. Uh, not tremendously important, uh, just know that this ret q instruction here is what's hopefully going to get us back to main. Here's how. Uh, that at the stage that if I were to pause the debugger here before executing this instruction, I'd see the RIP has a value of 467A, uh, that's this return instruction. The stack pointer has a value of E458, uh, and if you track back one quick, uh, that's where it was exactly when I started this procedure. That uh, will be an important thing that we address uh, uh, later on. Uh, it's uh, then the case that if I were to examine the, what's at that location, I still have this 4691 address there. If you step a single instruction, that is to execute this return instruction up here, then you'll suddenly find yourself back in main. Because what the return uh, instruction does is to pick up off the stack, whatever the stack point is pointing at, uh, treat that as the return address. And so this 4691 uh, gets copied into the RIP, which control-wise gets me over here. And you also see the stack is adjusted. I've consumed this uh, return address, and so the stack shrinks up from 458 up here uh, to 460. Uh, that's essentially popping an address off uh, the stack pointer moves up by eight, shrinking. And this gets me back into main uh, with the conditions almost exactly as they were prior to this call instruction. Uh, there are a couple notable changes that we'll talk about in a second, uh, but that's the essentials of how at the architecture level you solve this problem of a function that's returning need to know where to return to. Uh, it's stored in the stack. Uh, this is a blessing because it means you can uh, do things like call functions arbitrary deeply, call from arbitrary spots, have recursive functions that have separate stack frames each and know how to get back to each other. But it's also going to have some uh, difficulties associated with that, and that um, since you're storing something in the stack that's important, a uh, control element, then there's a vulnerability there that if you mess up your stack, you jump away from uh, where you are to some place uh, that is potentially dangerous. Uh, ideally out of bounds, because then the operating system will catch it and cause you uh, to sort of detect that, that there's some sort of problem uh, and kill the program. But this has also been historically the source of attacks where folks try to write some address into the stack that gets the program to start doing things that it's not necessarily supposed to do. So then, uh, there are a couple things associated with procedure calls that uh, bears uh, mention. Uh, first, there's one part of the x86-64 application binary interface, uh, acronym ABI, uh, that states that you have to align the stack at 16-byte boundaries uh, when you're calling functions. Uh, this it doesn't always cause problems if you fail to do it, uh, but we'll be enforcing it as part of the criteria for uh, Project 3 uh, that you should be doing this, maybe making some notes about it. So oftentimes in terms of procedure setups, uh, in a main for instance, if you're eventually going to call a sum range, you'll see some assembly instruction that adjusts the stack pointer by 8 bytes. This is because the return address for main is in the stack already. Uh, so there are eight bytes in the frame associated with main. If you move down another eight bytes, uh, then that's a total of 16 bytes that main occupies, and that sets you up to be at a 16 byte uh, boundary, as you would call some range. Uh, any change that you make to the stack pointer uh, via subtraction, for instance here, has to be undone uh, via an addition or a pop uh, later on uh, down here, because that positions the stack pointer back where it was uh, when main started, uh, allowing it to return properly. Um, uh, I'll mention just quickly that uh, the failure to uh, uh, sort of align has unpredictable results. In some cases it might work, in some cases it might not. Uh, but uh, it's always important uh, that you do it if you want your code to be portable. 
Uh, and again, it's very dangerous if you're to only do the subtraction and forget to do the addition. If you're only to do a push and not have a pop, we'll talk about this instruction in a second uh, later on, uh, that'll probably get you into real bad uh, trouble uh, right quick. Um, so there's a second reason that one might make adjustments to the stack pointer we'll get to in just a second. But for the moment, uh, just to call a function, you have to make sort of an arbitrary uh, uh, move of the stack pointer to get it aligned at a 16-byte boundary. Uh, and this is to be compatible with some of the processor internals that we generally don't have access to. Uh, according to what we've learned so far, uh, we've seen that there are some special considerations associated with uh, registers and function calls. Uh, we've seen since early on that the x86-64 made the novel decision uh, to put a lot of arguments, uh, six, uh, up to six rather, uh, into uh, registers instead of uh, other places it could be, notably the stack. So as you'd be calling a function which has three arguments, you'd be making use of RDI, RSI, and RDX to pass those arguments to the function. Uh, if you had five arguments, uh, then you'd be making use of the first five registers here. And in most cases, you would access those registers according to whatever the bit width size is. For instance, if the first argument to the function is an int, int, then probably you'd access the 32-bit version of the DI register, uh, EDI. If the second argument was a pointer, uh, a 64-bit quantity on 64-bit architectures, then you'd make use of RSI. Uh, and a third argument was a short, uh, only a 16 byte quantity, you'd probably be accessing only the DX portion of that register. If you have more arguments than six, and this is somewhat rare, but certainly possible, uh, then the additional arguments, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so forth, they get pushed into the stack. Uh, and I believe it's in order of uh, the sort of first argument is the first thing to be pushed the second argument is the second thing to be pushed, but I could be uh, uh, reversing that in my head. It doesn't happen too often, and it isn't pertinent to the project. Uh, I'll mention this now, that, and we'll I'll round back to it, that it used to be the case that in preceding architectures to x86-64, uh, for instance, the old Intel 32-bit architecture, there were no registers used for arguments. Instead, everything went into the stack, and generally then this put more memory pressure on programs. Uh, we'll see later when we study the memory system that registers are as fast as possible. Uh, whereas if you put things in main memory, in particular the stack, uh, then you'll have to wait potentially on the memory system to service uh, those requests. Uh, we won't deal with this in any more detail than that right now, but we'll see some interactions with the stack uh, shortly. A few other things uh, that are worthwhile to note associated with registers. The register file, uh, the registers you have available, are divided roughly in half between uh, registers that you can use freely within a function. Uh, these are known as the caller save registers. And registers that, if you change them in your function, you're obligated to restore them. Uh, so these are the so-called callee save registers. Uh, and this relates to the semantics of my function was called by something else. Uh, so Chris's function is the callee, and for absence, main called it, so main is the caller. Uh, as you go across these function boundaries, uh, then uh, my function, Chris's function, can change all of these guys freely, and it's the responsibility of main who called me uh, to be robust, that if I changed R9 to something else, then main has a way of uh, uh, getting around that. It doesn't care in any particular reason. However, main expects that these registers, RBX, RBP, and so forth, uh, those should not change. So that if during my function, I decide I need to use R12 for something, I should save it probably in the stack and restore it before returning to main, because main will expect whatever it put in R12 uh, to be there after the point. And we'll see, uh, since this happens with some frequency, uh, we'll, there are some special instructions associated with saving registers there, the push and pop instructions. Uh, again, be very careful with messing, messing with the stack pointer itself because as a function uh, is going about its business, if it makes changes to the stack pointer, uh, then it will the stack pointer will no longer refer to its return address and you'll need to return the stack pointer wherever it was when the function started in order to know where the return address is and get back to it. So generally, just avoid using the stack pointer uh, except for what it's supposed to be used for, uh, which is to refer to stack elements.
Uh, finally then, uh, the easiest one to remember is that the return values for functions in this x86-64 protocol, uh, they are in the RAX family register, 64-bit uh, quantities in RAX, 32 in EAX, and so on down the line. There is a set of, of assembly instructions, uh, push and pop, associated with manipulations of the stack uh, that bear a little bit of mention. We discussed just a moment ago that some registers, uh, for instance, RBP, are callee save registers. So that if this function main, for instance, was going to mess around with stuff in um, uh, uh, the uh, BP uh, family register, uh, and you'll see one down here that it does some stuff, uh, gets a return value from some range, and then moves that return value into this uh, EBP uh, register. So EBP is a callee save register uh, in the list uh, that's up over here. Uh, you can see it right here. Uh, this means that if main is making changes to it, whoever called main, and there are functions above main in the runtime system, it doesn't expect EBP to change at all. And so this change that's made here onto EBP uh, is it's possible to do it and get away with it if you follow the following protocol. Towards the beginning of the main function, you issue a push instruction. Uh, and in this case, I'm pushing RBP. This has two effects. It will extend the stack, as in grow it by Q. Uh, that's a quad word, so 64 bits or 8 bytes. Uh, it'll grow the stack by that amount, and then take the value that's currently in RBP and copy it into the stack. There's now a sort of permanent copy in main memory that backs up what was in this register. So that as I make changes to it, for instance, move a new value into EBP, which overwrites its current value, uh, I still have a copy of it in the stack that I can get to. Uh, so as you do towards the beginning of the function, push something in, uh, into the stack, uh, the value of RBP, if you wanted to restore it, it'd be as easy as popping off of the stack. Presuming that the stack pointer is uh, the, at some position like 1024 here after the push, uh, the pop right here will um, move the stack pointer up to a higher value, 1032, that shrinks it, uh, and take the value that was there and copy it in RBP, uh, which will restore uh, that base pointer to the value that was expected by whoever called main. Uh, this gets around this problem then of uh, I have some registers I can use, these call e save, or caller or save registers within my own functions, but if I need more registers, uh, these are available. I just have to do a little bit of extra work in order to restore them to whoever is uh, coming back. Uh, be care very careful about that because in some cases, if you make a change to R12 uh, but don't restore it, you can get away with it. But in other cases, uh, this will cause problems or mysterious errors later on. Human eyes, as you uh, they will uh, move on to your project, will probably be looking for if you use any of these registers, uh, did you push and pop them uh, or otherwise restore them uh, prior to returning from the function. And this paradigm uh, of pushing a register here, you can push as many as you want as long as you pop them in appropriate order by later on. Uh, this is uh, what's usually done in order to set up uh, that stuff. Okay, so there's a last sort of part to this, uh, an allusion to it here uh, uh, in this uh, previous slide uh, that has to do with uh, registers and the interaction with main memory that you're well aware now that even with the technique we demonstrated here, um, you only have these 16 or 15 or so general purpose registers to store data in. Uh, but if you need something more than that, uh, then you'll be looking to main memory for it. And in particular, if you need certain values to have addresses, then it becomes important to establish how do I get an address uh, for main memory. Registers themselves cannot be addressed in the x86-64 address. Uh, you're only just going to refer to these things as RAX, RCX. They don't have a proper memory address in that respect. Some weird architectures out there actually give memory addresses, main memory addresses of the register file, but uh, the Intel family is not one of them. So uh, to demonstrate then the second reason that you would manipulate the stack uh, to open up space uh, for local variables, we're going to have a look at uh, two pieces of code, uh, swap pointers.c, which we looked at very early in the semester when we were learning, first learning C, and an assembly equivalent of it. And what we'll do is walk through a few interesting things uh, that our parents in the swap pointers assembly uh, version and uh, sort of contrast them with what we've learned about the, the C version.
I'll flip over to my editor over here quick. Uh, I gotta pull up uh, swappointers.c. As you can see on the left hand side over here is a swap pointer function, uh, that's in C, and then a main function that calls it. Importantly, uh, this made use of two pointer arguments. Uh, used a little temporary here to dereference A, uh, and then went about the business of ch exchanging the values in A and B uh, through this intermediary temp. Uh, its usage over here in main was to establish uh, two local variables, X and Y, 19 and 31, uh, to use their addresses, and the ampersand here is significant, it's uh, whatever memory cell address X is stored in, whatever memory cell uh, Y uh, its address is stored in, pass those in rather than the values 19 and 31, which allows this swap pointer to actually uh, make changes uh, that are local to main, uh, but non-local to swap pointer. You can see, certainly over here, the equivalent versions of those things in assembly in C are much more obtuse, uh, that they're longer. But a couple interesting things to point out about it. Um, first, over here in assembly, uh, you'll notice that unlike in the C version over here with a, a temp variable, uh, and when we discussed this, uh, it was presumed that this temp variable is probably in the stack someplace, had a memory cell, uh, there is no interaction with the stack and swap pointer. And this is a sort of startling lie that I've been telling for uh, quite a long time, uh, that not every local variable needs to go into the stack. We discovered that since you have this register file, which is full of values, um, uh, sort of spots that you could manipulate fairly directly, uh, then you do something like move whatever RDI is pointing at into the register EAX, move whatever RSI is uh, pointing to in uh, into the register EDX, and then move those back to their respective spots. Um, uh, RDI in this case was pointing to um, X, uh, so I'll move the value I got from Y uh, back there and vice versa over here. Uh, so the temporary space that I needed isn't in the stack, uh, this temp guy isn't. Uh, instead it's in the register file uh, and I don't need to do anything special there. Uh, so this swap pointer uses very little stack space the only thing it probably uses is the space for its return address, which is necessary to facilitate this uh, return. Uh, it's pushed in there by main during its call sequence. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to point out and reiterate that here's another instance in which I'm using a move L, uh, but the address that I'm working with is 64 bits. Uh, the destination, in this case, is 32 bits. This is uh, RDI contains a 64-bit memory address, but there are only four bytes that are present at that memory address that I want to deal with, thus the move L instead of a move Q. Down here in main is where we're going to spend more of our time. And the first thing you see is something we alluded to, um, a manipulation of the stack pointer. Subtraction by eight here. Uh, and the reason that one would do that is to open up space in the stack to put a 19 and a 31 in there. Uh, you can see obviously values here, 19, that must be associated with X. So that's at the lowest stack address. And then four bytes above it is where I'm gonna put a 31. Uh, that's where Y must be. Now, there's a question is sort of like, well, why would I even want uh, to put anything in the stack here? Like, can't I use the same technique I did up here uh, in swap pointer where I used registers for this uh, local variable temp instead? Uh, why can't I do that in main down here? And the reason is because I need to pass a memory address for X and for Y in here. And that will not work since I can't get addresses for registers. Uh, so instead, I have to put them in main memory. And you'll see the next sequence of instructions after getting them into main memory, the X and the Y, are to calculate addresses for them. Uh, first, the X, which is at the top of the stack, I can just copy the value for the stack pointer into RDI. Uh, and in the second pass, I'll use this load effective address instruction, which uh, will calculate what's the stack pointer plus four bytes, take that address that I calculated, store that in RSI. Uh, this sets me up to have then main memory addresses uh, for these two spots of the stack that correspond to the X and the Y uh, variables. I'm now in a position to call swap pointer. You notice that the spots that I moved the memory addresses, uh, the stack pointer, which refers to X, uh, and four off the stack pointer, which is uh, refers to Y, they're in the first two argument registers, RDI and RSI. Uh, then as I call swap pointer, uh, control shifts up here where RDI refers to X and RSI refers to Y. Uh, 
so to that end, uh, this little bit of assembly code down here then sets me up for a couple things. Um, it puts some values in main memory, calculates their addresses, and stores those addresses uh, in the arguments associated with a swap pointer. Uh, importantly, I've also accomplished a second uh, sort of goal, which is to set up this uh, function call by virtue of the uh, subtraction of eight here. You recall a line like this showed up uh, associated with just uh, enabling function calls and that in order to do this call swap pointer I have to align to a 16 byte boundary so this sub queue serves two purposes gets me that alignment because there are already 8 bytes there for the return address for main uh, 8 more gets me to a 16 byte boundary and down here then I have space on the stack for two 4 byte ints uh, subtraction of 8 gets me 8 bytes one for the x uh, it's 19 and one for the y uh, that is 31 an alternative uh, to subtracting eight directly off the stack pointer would be to do something like pushing, uh, like pushing eight on. The queue here uh, would also be eight bytes. The advantage here is that that would initialize the space on the stack to zeros. So I'd put eight, push eight bytes of zeros on there. Uh, but for since I plan to put values in there already myself, as in one of them will be 19, one will be 31, uh, I favor the subtraction instruction up here. But either of these in this case would, would do. You'll see then after uh, the called swap pointer, I go through some um, uh, rigmarole in order to set up a call to printf. Uh, we aren't going to discuss that in great detail, uh, but calling printf itself, as we discussed early on, is kind of a pain. I mean, you have to have a format string someplace, and you can see it down here. Uh, you have to use some special conventions to indicate that this is a variable argument function, and uh, to that end, I'm uh, not going to sort of go through any of the additional discussion that might be necessary, because you're not going to have to do it in a project. Uh, importantly then, the last thing that we'd want to see is undoing the change we made to the stack. Uh, here, I opened up eight bytes associated with the two local variables I need. And this relates back to an early part of the discussion in which we discussed that as the compiler would look at a function like main over here and see, ah, I need uh, some space for x and some space for y, and that space has to have main memory addresses. Usually with a single move as I'd start main, I get space for those. And here's the realization for that. Right at the beginning of main, I open up enough space uh, for those two local variables, uh, eight bytes total. And down here, to clean up the stack frame associated with main, I'm adding eight onto the stack pointer. Uh, then set up the return address, uh, and I'm good to get back from main right now. If you had more local variables, uh, for instance, if I added a long down here and a couple structs and so forth, very likely the compiler would calculate some total size for all of those local variables and you'd see a subtraction of some kind up here uh, that would open up space in main for all the local variables uh, 16 bytes 32 bytes whatever else uh, it would sometimes pad that space uh, for instance I only needed uh, uh, 16 bytes of space. That might be padded to be 24 in case I was going to do some function calls down here because 24 and 8 is 32. That's divisible by 16. So I'd have both the space for the locals and the space needed uh, the right alignment for function calls. But I digress on that because there are a lot of possibilities there. So even in a tiny simple function uh, like swap uh, and swap pointer uh, with the main here, you can see a lot of the mechanics associated with assembly uh, at play. And the code that you see here that is handwritten and annotated is very close to what you'd get if you compiled uh, this C program and had assembly output with this debug level optimization enabled. Uh, let's see, so I think I've answered most of the questions uh, in here that we want to talk about. Uh, just a couple of additional details uh, associated with the stack then. Uh, as you would see local variables uh, that would show up in some uh, function calls. Uh, so for instance here there's a main and I have an integer size and a character buff over here. And according to what I'm doing uh, down here, I need buff to be in main memory. That's fairly obvious because it's a, a, an array. And I need a memory address for size, so it also has to be uh, in main memory. The total size of these, an integer 4 bytes and a character buffer 16, that's 16 bytes. So that's 24 total. Uh, it's very likely that the compiler would pad this just a little bit. Uh, so that uh, the 20 bytes needed for this would actually be a subtraction of 24. That would enable uh, alignment at the 16-byte boundary so that one would have 
uh, uh, the ability to call functions in an architecture in um, a uh, safe way. Uh, so you can work through so the assembly equivalent of some of this stuff down here, uh, but a couple other things to point out are that then the top of the stack in this case is that size uh, and the push uh, characters that show up here in sort of increasing order in memory as uh, means that this buff starts at memory of just 1028. You'll also note then that the compiler has uh, chosen its the ordering that it prefers right, for this stuff that size is here lower down on the stack uh, and buff is at a higher point here. Generally the compiler has an algorithm that it uses here but you as a programmer at the C level don't have a lot of control on that part. The last thing I'll mention is a historical aside. Uh, the architecture that preceded x86-64, which is what we've been studying, uh, is this 32-bit architecture uh, referred to as either 32-bit x86 or IA32. It had a very different set of conventions associated with the stack. Uh, instead of making use of the registers to pass arguments in, everything was passed through the stack itself. And so your standard setup for a function like foo over here, where it'd be calling some callee function with one, two, three, would look something like this uh, in uh, the assembly rendering of it. That to set up a function call, uh, it would change where the stack pointer, uh, sorry, make a copy of the stack pointer in another special register called the base pointer. Uh, this would then say, uh, be the case that uh, I would push some more stuff into the stack and the base pointer would essentially be uh, the top of the stack, or not the top, the bottom of, of a stack frame, and the stack pointer would be the top of a stack frame, so they would be boundaries, as in uh, the base pointer would be the beginning of the last stack frame for, for whatever function is calling uh, this thing. Uh, so the pushes here then of 3, 2, 1, uh, they're on in main memory uh, in the stack instead of being in registers like uh, RDI and RSI and, and so forth. Uh, on the call, uh, then control would transfer to bar, uh, there would be a return address uh, that is pushed in, uh, and then as you'd return from this thing, uh, you'd have to take the base pointer and move it to the stack pointer, uh, which undoes this uh, change up here. So the base pointer, EBP, that becomes a very important register as well, but it's taken out of general purpose use because it's used entirely to bound the stack frame associated with the currently running function. Um, it was realized because compilers have, had become more sophisticated uh, that this technique was no longer necessary in the 64-bit era. That the compiler was going to keep track in most cases of where the top of the stack was. It could easily calculate this is how much space is needed for a function to run. And memory was generally cheaper so things uh, didn't have to be pushed and popped nearly so much. Uh, for speed then, and to gain one more general purpose register. Uh, the modern 64-bit uh, era moves things uh, into registers for arguments, and then the base pointer is not used. Instead, the stack pointer is the only thing that keeps track of what's in the stack. So the base pointer becomes this uh, additional register that you can make use of. Depending on how you compile stuff, though, uh, it may be that the base pointer looks like it's in use uh, to bound the stack frame. Uh, to demonstrate that, uh, let me just come over here. Uh, and I'm going to take the code that we have here uh, for swap pointers. Uh, I'm going to compile this uh, first uh, just without any uh, switches over here, except that I will. I want to make sure I don't. Yeah. Uh, um, except that I'll ask for assembly output. If I open up here, GCC, uh, sorry, the uh, swap pointers.s, which is the automatically generated stuff. Uh, you can see that there are a bunch of things done, uh, in particular this RSP to RBP move over here, uh, associated with uh, swap pointer and also with main down here. And this is a legacy of that 32-bit architecture. By de uh, default, the compiler, uh, even in 64-bit systems, generates code that's somewhat compatible with that 32-bit uh, architecture. Uh, however, if I turn on even the mildest sort of optimizations, uh, for instance, these uh, debug level optimizations that will do a few things uh, and tweak things so it's uh, somewhat more readable at the assembly level. Uh, let's see. Uh, wait for that to refresh. Uh, you can see I get code that's 
almost exactly like I had in my hand annotated example, that there's no mention of the stack pointer or the base pointer here. They're not needed in this case. Uh, and while in main down here, there are a few changes uh, that still mention uh, BP, uh, you can see that there isn't any, uh, or sorry, this is RBX rather, it must be used uh, later on down here. Uh, you can see there isn't any mention of the base pointer and interaction with the stack pointer. Uh, instead, I have a subtraction here of uh, 16 off the stack pointer, a uh, little different than what the hand-coded assembly version is, uh, but n nothing major on, on that front. So uh, that will conclude our discussion of assembly control. Uh, and it's, I think, worthwhile just to uh, mention again a couple things that the x86-64 architecture is somewhat different than its preceding uh, set of uh, function or uh, preceding set of architectures. So you'll want to avoid the kinds of things that show up on uh, this slide and favor the kinds of things that we've discussed earlier on. Uh, and that all of the bits and pieces that we talked about in terms of assembly uh, come into play as you are working uh, to get one function to call another one. Uh, we will pick up uh, on our next discussion uh, with some wrap-up, uh, including discussions of assembler directives for data and some security issues, and then touch briefly on how you access the floating point side of things. Uh, that should come on Friday then, and I will see you then.